Turn with me in your Bibles back to Isaiah chapter 9, where we were reading from before. We just sang, now the days are hastening on by prophets foretold. That, that age of gold, it said, that when peace will, over the whole earth, its ancient splendors fling, and the whole world will give back the song that now the angels sing. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Not kind of. <laughs> it is what we're talking about here this morning as we look at God's Word. We're looking at the subject of hope. As, as uh, Rick and Marilyn read for us and they're lighting the, the first Advent candle, we talk about prophecy and the prophecy that led up to the birth of Christ. The prophecy that pointed toward the birth of Christ. And that prophecy is really about hope. It's about giving hope to people that are waiting, that are longing for deliverance. And that's what Isaiah chapter 9, these first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 9, that's what they're doing for us. And in, in reminding us of this subject of hope, and in thinking about Israel's hope, as they look forward to the coming of the Messiah, it ought to give us hope and, and turn our eyes not just back to when Jesus came and was born in the manger, you know, laid in the manger and then grew and died and, and was resurrected and ascended into heaven. We don't just look back, but we too look forward in hope. Because the hope of Christmas is not yet all behind us. There is hope that we still look forward to. Here in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, we're looking at I say, Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 7 specifically. And this passage gives us a glimpse of hope, which is smack in the middle of a section where God is denouncing the faithlessness of his people. Uh, earlier in, in the, the book of Isaiah, the passages leading up to this one include God's word through Isaiah to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, Isaiah is writing, uh, he's prophesying to, is this thing working? Maybe, maybe not. Well, anyway, yeah, you want to take this, Rick, and work on that one. <laughs> Hold the candle up. <laughs> All right. So Isaiah is prophesying. Ah, oh, here we go. Thank you. It's a really stunning visual that I have here for you. That's why I'm so concerned that you have to be able to see this. Are you ready? You are fine. Wow! It was worth the wait, wasn't it? So I think, I think it's valuable for us to be able to, to see the map of Israel at the time that Isaiah is writing. He's writing during the divided kingdom, um, when, when it was divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And, and the king of Judah, Isaiah is prophesying to the king of Judah because the king of Judah, Ahaz, just heard that the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria were banding together to come down against him. And Isaiah, God sends Isaiah to prophesy and, and to say to Ahaz, don't be afraid of them. God, God will wipe them away using the Assyrian Empire, who is you know, much further up outside of that. That's in chapter uh, 7. God's going to raise up the Assyrians to destroy these armies that are coming against them. Well, if you, if you look at 2 Kings and read the story there, you find that Ahaz, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, didn't listen to God, and he actually called for help uh, from, from uh, the Assyrians, and he, he, you know, uh, God ends up bringing judgment on Ahaz as well. As chapter 7 continues here in Isaiah, God denounces the lack of faith and the faithfulness, lack of faithfulness that he sees in the southern kingdom as well. And so he assures them that the Assyrian army will overflow their banks. He uses this, this metaphor of a river overflowing its banks. And he says they're going to come into, they're going to come into Judah as well and, and destroy them and bring destruction and death. 
And he talks about how they'll be thrust into darkness. And that's the passage leading right up to here in chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9. Look at the last verse of Isaiah chapter 8. He says, They will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. So then we have this section here, Isaiah chapter 9, beginning of Isaiah chapter 9, and then actually beyond this, Isaiah goes back to, to sort of, uh, all the way through chapter 10, we find large sections of prophetic judgment against both kingdoms, Israel and Judah, the north and the south, for their wickedness and idolatry. And then he also denounces Assyria uh, for their arrogance and pride, thinking that they're doing all these things by their own might, when actually it's God that's using them as his tool of punishment on Israel. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, like I said, is smacked out in the middle of all this. On either side, there are prophecies of judgment and darkness and gloom and all this stuff that God is going to do to his people to punish them for their lack of faith, for their turning to other gods for help, turning to other nations for help instead of trusting in the Lord. And we get here these seven verses sandwiched between significant judgment passages. Why? Well, it's because they offer a glimpse of the hope that is based on what would God, what God would accomplish later on, once his punishment had run its course. In God's pronouncement of judgment on his people, he gives them this glimpse of hope. It says, but, the very first word of Isaiah chapter 9, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. There will be. Not right now, but a day is coming. There's this glimpse of hope. I'm convinced that as we study Isaiah's prophecy about this child who is to be born, we're going to see that glimpse of hope, and it's going to stoke our hope uh, as we look forward for ourselves as well. So let's first of all unpack the first three verses, which gives us kind of this picture of hope. It paints a picture of what life will be like once God has fulfilled his promises. The turning point we already pointed out there in verse 1, but there, there will be thrust into darkness, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. This is talking about the different tribes of Israel. It's, reference, it's a reference to Israel in general. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. He talks about how God will make glorious. He will, he will uh, bring about peace and, and grace to the land around the Galilee. And, and if you know anything about um, New Testament history, you know the area where Jesus did the primary first part of his ministry was the area right around Galilee, around, around the, the Sea of Galilee. Already, we're picking up on some things that, that should spark our memory. What's the thing that he says, uh, how, how does he describe this, this uh, time in the future? First of all, he says, the people who walk in gr great darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. Now he just got done talking about people being thrust into darkness, right? Who are the people getting thrust into darkness? His own people, Israel. The Israelites are being thrust into darkness, and he says, but this time is coming when actually the darkness is turned to light. And in scriptural, uh, metaphorical language, having light shine upon you has to do with the idea of having God's grace being shown to you. And, and so you'll see references to, you know, Lord, let the light of your face shine upon us or turn your face toward us. We were talking about this a little bit in our uh, fellowship group um, last week. Uh, the idea that 
in biblical language, having God's light shine upon you is, is metaphorically saying it's, he's, he's showing you mercy and grace. And so these people who were walking in darkness, they were, they were under God's judgment and punishment for their lack of faithfulness to him. Instead, God's light will shine upon them. But then he goes on in verse 3. He says, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. As they are glad when they divide the spoil. The second thing he talks about there is multiplication of joy. Multiplication of joy. Now notice the present tense of the grammar here. Not you will multiply the nation, but you have multiplied the nation. Do you see that? What's, what's going on here? I thought he said up in, in verse 1, you know, in the former time he brought into contempt, that in the future he will do this, and now he's saying you have done this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. You have multiplied. Is it, did it already happen or did it not yet happen? Which one is it? You see, I think, I think what we're seeing here is evidence of the fact that biblical hope, when God gives a glimpse of hope to his people, it's not hope like we think of hope, where I, I hope I get that new remote control car for Christmas, or you know, I hope my team wins the big game or whatever. No, biblical hope is a certain thing. When, it's, when you hope in the promises of God, it is a certain hope. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews can talk about it being an anchor for our soul. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. And so Isaiah is prophetically kind of placing himself in the future already, and he's saying, you've already done it, God. You've already, you've, you've multiplied their joy, and he's kind of talking about things sort of in the present tense, as if God has already done it. That's how certain this hope is. Now, the people have to hold on to this hope for several centuries before this Messiah was to be born. And we too, in our day, we hope in the promises yet to be fulfilled. When Jesus said, I will, I will come back and I will take you to be with me so that where I am, there you may be forever. Right? We, we have this hope in Christ that we hold on to and, and it is a certain hope. But it still requires holding on to, doesn't it? We still have to remind ourselves of this hope that we have. We still have to cling to this hope by faith. God promised that the people would have their joy increased. And they would rejoice before you. And he uses a couple of metaphors here. Look at verse 3 again. As with joy at the harvest. You think about living in an agricultural society. You know, we, it's, it's hard for us to, to feel the impact of the joy of harvest in our, for most of us, I would say. If you're anything like me, it's like, yeah, harvest time is any time I go down to Giant or ShopRite. And I swipe my car and I carry my groceries home, right? And I can get pineapple any time of year because they ship it in from who knows where. And it's like, you know, no big deal. But think about living in an agricultural society where you're not going to eat that, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to eat unless everything goes just right. Maybe there's, there's no hailstorms, there's no animals that get into the crops and mess everything up. Make sure that the soil is just right, you actually get a good, good enough crop, you can sell some to support your family and eat some for yourself. The joy of harvest has to do with the joy of reaping the benefit of all this waiting. And there's so many things that can go wrong, that can ruin the harvest before you get there. And so when you have a good harvest, it's like, yeah! It's a party. And this is the reason why, you know, we have this tradition of, you know, harvest home and, you know, Thanksgiving, and it's like a celebration, right? It's like, man, this time of year, we see literally God's provision in all the food that we were able to reap. He says, that's the kind of joy that you're going to experience. 
That's the kind of joy that my people will experience in this blessed new life that I'm going to create for them. It's the kind of joy that says, we've been waiting, we've been struggling, it's been tough, we weren't sure we were going to make it, and now, here we are. We have the joy of the harvest. And he mentions another metaphor as well. He says, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. So first he uses sort of a harvest metaphor, and then next he uses a, a, a war metaphor, a battle metaphor. But you can see the similarity there. In har with harvest, you're rejoicing at the end of a long period of struggle and waiting. At, when you divide the spoil, it means that you won, right? So you're rejoicing at the end of a long period of battle, physical fighting, war. There's a battle first, and then the joy comes after. He says, I'm going to increase the joy of the people, of the nation. So Isaiah is painting here a picture of God's favor on his people, which brings about great joy at the end of suffering and punishment and battle. This promise is the source of their hope. This promise is the, is the picture, the glimpse that they're holding on to. This day will come. God has spoken it. He has promised it. So we need to ask ourselves, where's my hope anchored? Only the promises of God are a secure anchor for our hope. And we must not forget them. So maybe you need to ask yourself, you know, if you have a hard time uh, turning back to hope, remembering God's promises, maybe you need to say, you know, do I need to change something in my daily routine in order to put this glimpse of hope in front of my eyes more regularly? In order to be reminded of the hope that I have? How might this Christmas season Help me to view with fresh eyes the fact that God has shined his light into our darkness. That he has multiplied his people. That he has grafted me into his family. Because he's speaking here to the Israelites, right? He's speaking here about the joy for his people Israel. But as when Christ came, this promise and this hope exploded out to everyone. What does it look like to rejoice before God? Like it says in verse 3. They rejoice before you as with the joy at harvest or, or when they divide the spoil. What does it look like to rejoice before God? Can this Christmas season perhaps be a time of reminding yourself in fresh ways of the hope that you have because of what Jesus did? And because of what he's going to do. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Isaiah's prophecy here certainly gives us a glimpse of that future blessed state of God's people, uh, which would give them hope. And, but in the next verses, uh, he gets more specific about how they're going to get there. So let's look next at this idea of the reason for their hope. What's the reason that God gives them for this hope? Look at verse 4. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling, a tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. What's going to bring about this blessed state? How, how, uh, how is God going to do it? Well, first of all, he's going to bring an end to oppression and to war. You see there uh, in verse 4 this idea of oppression. The yoke of his burden, the staff on his shoulder. These are, this is language used for a slave having to, you know, having, uh, being chained down, having a yoke on his shoulder, having someone beating him, making him do things that he doesn't want to do. The rod of his oppressor you have broken as in the day of Midian. Think back to the book of Judges. Do you remember a guy named Gideon? Gideon was one of the judges of Israel. God raised him up when the Midianite people were oppressing Israel. 
They, they had come sweeping in, uh, they, they came sweeping in, and they were taking Israel's crops, and they were oppressing them, and, and God raises up Gideon to be a warrior against the Midianites. But how does God do it? And I use that, I, I, I use that phrase uh, very intentionally. How does God do it? Because if you remember the story of Gideon, Gideon calls Israel to himself, and they, and, you know, they come out in droves, thousands of them, and God says, no, that's too many people. You've got too many soldiers to go and fight the Midianites. Like, what? What kind of a war strategy is that? So God, you know, God tells Gideon to, you know, tell whoever's afraid, tell them to go home. A whole bunch of guys leave. And then God says, now it's still too many. Take them down to the river and see which ones uh, uh, get down to drink straight from the river with their mouth and which ones lap up the water, uh, you know, with their hand. And so Gideon does that, and, and God said, you know, send, send, send those guys home, the ones that, I think it was the ones that, uh, that yeah, took the, I can't remember, I should have. The ones that laid down aren't. See, you guys know the story. <laughs> 300 people left over. 300 people left over to go against the entire Midianite army of thousands. What's the point? God is making it crystal clear to everyone that it is he who accomplishes this battle. It's God who does it, not Gideon and his men. And in fact, God ups the ante even more because he says, you know, you're not even going to go in there and fight with your own swords. I want you to stand around their camp and blow the trumpets and smash your pots and shine your, your lanterns. And, it's, and God causes the Midianites to... So start killing each other. So when Isaiah references here God breaking the yoke of, of the burden and, and breaking the rod of the oppressor of his people, as he did on the day of Midian, he's making it crystal clear that this is God bringing about miraculous deliverance from oppression. And then look at verse 5 again. Every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. You're not going to need those war boots anymore. You're not going to need that garment dipped in blood. You kind of you get the idea of you know, the garment that you're wearing that, that throughout the battle you just get covered in blood. You're, he's talking about battle armor. You're not going to need it anymore. Can you imagine that? Living in a place where there doesn't need to be any army. There's, there's no such thing as body armor. There's no need for any of that. Because there's no more threat of war. No one's ever going to come after you again. This is what God will do. He will bring an end to oppression and to war. But how is he going to do it? Well, this brings us to the two verses that are really kind of the climax of this whole prophecy, this whole glimpse of hope. Everything is leading up to these last two verses. Look at verse 6. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. How is God going to bring this about? Through a child who was to be born. Notice the things that he says about this child. First of all, the child will be a ruler. He says there in verse 6, the government shall be upon his shoulder. So this is not just any child, but it's a child who is destined to rule, to have the government on his shoulder. The next thing he says about this child is that his identity will be wrapped up in the identity of God himself. 
Some other time, we're going to have to do a deeper study on these names mentioned here. But let's just do sort of a cursory reading of them. Wonderful Counselor. The one who knows, who gives counsel, who is, who is wonderful. He is a wonder in and of himself. Mighty God is the next name. This child is to be called the Mighty God? That's blasphemy for, from a Jewish perspective for any human being to, to make themselves equal with God, and yet this child who is to be born is identified as the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. and the Prince of Peace. In, in biblical times, and even somewhat nowadays, although it's, it, we don't have the association quite as strong now, but especially in, in biblical times, a person's name was their identity. It, it was, and not just, I don't just mean like, you know, I'm really fond of my name, Joel, but actually, Joel means Jehovah is God. And it's the name of a prophet, Joel, who, who, who proclaimed that Yahweh is God. And so, you know, you see in the Old Testament when God, when God develops a relationship with somebody, he changes their name. Abram be becomes Abraham. And uh, Jacob becomes Israel, God says. No longer will you be called Jacob, you'll be called Israel. So I'm going to give you a name that speaks to your identity. It speaks to who, who I am making you to be. And so when Isaiah here is prophesying and says that the name of this child would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, he's speaking about the identity of this child. This child's identity is wrapped up in that of God himself. And notice he says there, the, the last name, of uh, Prince of Peace. His rule is characterized by peace. It's a beautiful thing. We're going to get to that a little bit uh, deeper in just a second here. So as you, as you move through here, and you look at the beginning of verse 7, another thing that we notice about this child is that he reigns forever as the fulfillment of the promise that God made to David. He says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. This is going to be an eternally reigning person, this child who is to be born. He doesn't just reign for a time, because Israel had experienced that already. They had experienced an incredible time of blessing under Solomon, right? David's son, Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, and God brought an incredible blessing to the nation of Israel during that time. They probably felt like, hey, you know, this is it. Like, we are, we are experiencing all the promises of God right here. But Solomon didn't last forever. And even within Solomon's own lifetime, his heart was eventually turned away from God. He was turned to other gods by all, all of his wives that he had. And so, here, this child that is to be born, he will establish and uphold the throne of David over his kingdom, and he will do it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. How do you feel about big government? Because this verse says that of the increase of his government, there will be no end. But see, this isn't big government in the way that conservative, you know, America talks about big government. This is a guy who, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. He's going to establish it with real justice and real righteousness. This isn't, let me expand my, my control over everybody so that I can get more for myself, which is what happens every single time when a human being is put in charge of everything. Because we're, we are broken by sin, and so when we have that kind of power, we just want to gather for ourselves. 
Well, this person, he will rule over everything. But it's not going to be a bad thing. It's not going to be an oppressive thing. It's going to establish justice and righteousness and peace. Real peace. It's interesting to note that this isn't, this isn't just fulfilling the promise that God made to David. Because he talks about he talks here about you know sitting on the throne of David and being over his kingdom. And certainly this does fulfill the God the promise that God made to David. Because God said to David, I will, I will have uh, I will establish your throne forever. So God promised David an eternal throne. But here, this expands on that. It fulfills it and expands on it. Because this one doesn't just reign forever, but he reigns over everything. Not just the nation of Israel. And look at the end of verse 7. How do we know when all this is going to happen? Well, we've talked about it already a little bit. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The Lord of hosts is very important name for God here. It means he is the Lord of the armies of angels in heaven. Jesus talked about his ability to call down a legion of angels to save him when he was on the cross. He really does have all the power of the creator of the world at his disposal. And on top of that, he's got all these angels at his command. And what is he zealous for? What is he eager to do? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish what? Peace. Justice and mercy and righteousness forever and ever and ever. No more death, no more disease, no more hatred. That's what God is zealous for. And, and that is the basis of Israel's hope. It's the basis of our hope. This season we celebrate the birth of a child of whom the hosts of God said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Just as Isaiah said, unto us a child is born, the angel said, unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And those angels, those same angels, praised God and proclaimed glory to God and peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. We read about that in Luke chapter 2. But that child surprised everyone, didn't he? Because rather than ascending to power and ruling on David's throne, like we expect him to from Isaiah, instead he died the death of a criminal on a Roman cross. What hope is there in that? Was this really the fulfillment of Israel's hope, like Isaiah had promised? Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He promised to return and reign forever when he comes the second time. So the surprise was that when he came the first time, it was not to rule and to reign physically and bodily here on the earth. It was to die in our place, to solve the deeper problem of sin that's within us. Because that's, that is our problem. Our problem is not an external problem. If you put any one of us in the most, you know, peaceful, wonderful kind of society, we'll ruin it. Because the problem is within us. And so when he came, he came the first time to deal with this. And this is why we say that the hope of Christmas is a hope that we still cling to as we look forward. 
Because this one who came the first time to deal with sin and death is coming a second time to do these kinds of things that we read about here in Isaiah. To rule literally in person forever and ever. Already the Bible tells us that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And so that in, in that authority he sent us out to be his ambassadors, to be his witnesses to others. To tell them about this reigning king who is coming back. But we don't, haven't seen the final fulfillment of it yet, and so we continue to look forward. And I ask you the question, does this season fill you with hope and encourage you to look forward to the fulfillment of all that Jesus came to do? Ask yourself, does my life reflect the fact that Jesus not only came the first time to die for me, but that he's coming again to reign in justice and to establish peace? Does my life reflect that? That, that I really believe that he is coming back? What should the words of the prophets and the, the glimpse of hope that they give us do in our hearts this Christmas season? Well, I would encourage us to think about it sort of in two ways. First of all, these truths ought to encourage us to surrender ourselves to this God-man who was born as a child. That one did come, and he was born, and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. He is one with the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the almighty God. He is the, the, the almighty Father, the Prince of Peace. Are you trusting in him? Have you put your hope in him, the only one in whom there is certainty of salvation. But then secondly, we, are, we ought to live in the light of his eternal rule and reign. This means living day by day in hope. Recognizing that the battle, the, 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 the war has been won. Christ has accomplished our salvation by his death and resurrection. And now we engage in skirmishes in this life. We engage in spiritual warfare in this life, knowing that the end is certain. Living in light of his eternal reign means fearing the true king, caring more about what he thinks, what he has to say, than the lesser kings in my life. We all have different people in our lives who perhaps we look up to, perhaps there are people in authority over us. Who do we fear, first and foremost? Is it this ruling king who is coming again? If Jesus really is this child who was given to reign over everything for eternity in total justice and righteousness and peace, then a life of surrender to him and hoping in him is the only life that makes sense. The hope of Christmas is not just about a baby being born who would die in our place for, for our sins and bring forgiveness. It's about the God-man going on to rule forever and ever in a reign of peace and justice and righteousness. Let's live into that reality as we affirm our hope in Jesus Christ this Christmas season. Let's let this next month of Advent point our eyes toward, uh, forward in hope to the day when the one who was born 2,000 years ago returns to reign for all eternity. In fact, that's the theme of the song that we're going to sing in closing today. We think of Joy to the World as a Christmas song. But really, it's a song written not about Jesus' first coming. It's about his return, his second coming. It's a song that looks forward and speaks of the eternal rule of the Savior of the world. So as we sing it together, we affirm 
that this is the hope we look forward to, the hope of Christmas. Last, would you come and lead us in singing joy to the world?